I'm here in Horse Guards Parade in the centre of London um, and in the office of the Duke of Wellington. Wellington's desk is just behind where I'm sitting and the place is surrounded by artefacts. The room is exactly as it was in 1827 when he was commander of the army and used to work in this office. And I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Bernard Cornwell, the celebrated author, the most famous author of historical novels, I think, um, in our uh, society. He is the author of a very famous set of novels on Sharp, Richard Sharp, the soldier who uh, fought in so many of Wellington's armies. And he's written 23 novels about Sharp so far, 24th coming out next year. He created Uhtred and the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, he's written about the American uh, War of Independence and sundry other things. Bernard, it is a delight to welcome you here. It's a pleasure to be here, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> and here in Wellington's office, um, do you feel the spirit of this man? I mean, this, this is a man that you created. In, in, in creating Sharp, this rifleman, his story does figures of eight with Wellington's story. So you created a Wellington. He inhabits your imagination. He does, yes, very much so. And do, I mean, do you feel him here? Well, I can imagine him here, certainly. Mm. I think he'd rather like this room. Um, Although most of my time, I imagine Wellington in the peninsula. Yes, and we will come to that. We'll talk about Wellington's campaigns. But I'm interested in the sort of person that you thought he was, the sort of characteristics of the man. He wasn't an easy man to get to know. He wasn't and you an seem easy to get man. to know him very well. Well, I think I know him well, um, and I'm pretty sure he wouldn't like me. Um, I mean, he detested authors. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so he would start off with a definite animus against me. Um, yep. And he's far more disciplined than I am, so I think he would probably disapprove of me, but I rather like him, and yeah. I rather enjoy writing him. I mean, he once complained he had no small talk, um, and most people found him rather cold and forbidding when they first met him. Um, but, I mean, the more I write him, the more admiration I have for the man. Yeah, yeah. and yet he starts life, I mean, he's born in 1769, exactly the same year as Napoleon, mm -hmm. into not dissimilar circumstances, the minor aristocracy. He was, he was a member of the aristocracy, I mean, in the Mornington family in Ireland, um, but he's a sort of an outsider to the mainstream aristocracy, just like Napoleon. And yet, whereas Napoleon is, is filled with um, purpose and determination. Wellington is a very lackadaisical young man. Yes, what shall I do with my awkward son Arthur, as his mother wrote. Yeah. Yes, and, and then like Napoleon, he goes to a French military college, Angers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's there he begins to detect his life's purpose. Yeah. And he's turned down like, I mean, Kitty Packenham, who he proposes to, and the family think that he's, his prospects aren't good enough, really. And so she turns him down, and that apparently traumatizes him a little bit. And he takes his military studies rather more seriously afterwards. Yes, and then has the good fortune to be posted to India. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is the making of him. Yeah. Um, yeah you know, and something about that early career that always interests me, I mean, that he, because he was able to buy his ranks, he, I mean, he first he goes to, to Flanders with the Duke of York and that awful campaign, and he's a complete amateur. He turns out to be good at command, but he goes with no military experience at the level of colonel. That's, that seems astonishing, but that's part of the army that you've written about. Yes, well, Flanders is interesting because, as he says, I learned about what not to do. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the big differences between him and Napoleon is that Wellington actually did serve as a company commander and then a battalion commander, whereas Napoleon seemed to j jump straight yeah. up to lieutenant general, major general, I can't remember. Yeah, but yeah he, because he, in revolutionary times, that, yeah. was, <laughs> that was what happened. Um, and Wellington has a comprehension of what a junior officer does in the army. Yeah. Um, and certainly, as he said, he learned what not to do in Flanders. Mm. And he goes to India, and you say he's there for many years, and that, that is the making of him. And, and these, these battles that he fights doesn't get them all right at Serengapitam, not to, to begin with, but he seems to develop the instinct for real command in India. Well, I think he discovers that he can command. I mean, and his one worst mistake is the Serengapitam, the Sultana Petatope, yep. Yep. which puts him off night actions forever, which is not a bad thing in those days. No. 
But I mean, it's there where he begins to display what is perhaps his prime talent, which is common sense. Mm. I mean, the army was a mess. I mean, the organization of the army is a mess. Um, you know, with the Ordnance Board providing rations for the artillery and a separate one providing our rations mm -hmm. for the... I mean, it's a mess. And mm -hmm. the generals on the whole don't seem to know their business. And along comes Wellington, who is very clear-eyed about what is going on and manages to make the whole thing work. And what he learns in India, I think, above everything else, is the importance of logistics, yeah. Um, yeah. which he never forgot. Of course, in later life, when he was asked, what are you most proud of, it was essay. And I think Assay was, was a huge gamble for him, um, where he, get, he throws everything, all the dice on the table for mm. this idea to turn the enemy's left. Mm. And it worked. And it ne but nearly failed, though, didn't it? I mean, they, they, they were able to wheel round faster than they he anticipated. They did wheel round faster. And I was at Assay, and um, a farmer, it was the Scottish regiment that suffered so badly, 78, I can't remember. Yeah, now. 78. 78. And he farmed that plot of field where they were. And he occasionally digs up bones. Okay. And he said to me, they were very big men. And it turns out the Scottish soldiers on average were four inches taller than the English. Gosh. Um, so maybe he's right. Maybe he's right. But yeah. that field was filled with musket balls. Gosh. Um, I mean, he just kicked the furrows and out would fall two or three musket balls. Um, and there was Wellington's, what, 9,000 troops against about 45,000 mm -hmm. of the opposing army. And he crosses the ford that he has found Which himself. He detects himself, yes. And as you say, he puts all these cards on the table. It yeah, was a, a now-or-never moment for him. Discovering that ford was common sense. Yeah. Um, pure common sense. And I think he's, he takes that huge risk. I mean, the biggest myth about Wellington is that he was a defensive general. And you look at a Say, a Porto, Salamanca, I and mean, you can go through the list. And I mean, he's a brilliantly offensive general, but he doesn't want to take the offense if he can, if he can defend. Yes. Um, because he knows he's got a greater chance of success defending. Yes, yeah. But I think a Say gives him a confidence. Mm. And he takes that confidence to the peninsula. I mean, Assay is 1803, and he goes to the peninsula in 1808, and, and you know, he's back from India in 1805. Very briefly, very briefly meets Nelson, and then he's he's involved in the peninsula, and that's where he really earns his place in Napoleonic warfare history. I would say, is is that your sense? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, when I wrote my book on Waterloo, I mean, one of the if you like the plot points is that here you have what to acknowledge the two greatest soldiers of the age mm -hmm. who have never met, and it's like the two greatest tennis players of the age not meeting until the final. Yes. Um, and that was very much in his mind. I mean, he might deny it, but yeah. he knew his whole reputation was at stake on that ridge. And by then he had become, the, if not the most famous, the second most famous soldier in Europe. Yes, yeah. Which meant the world. Just thinking about the peninsula, again, logistics, he, get, he gets the logistics right after Except the... for the retreat from Burgos. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, he understood logistics. Mm. And it was, I mean, incredibly important to him. His quartermaster general was essentially his chief of staff, although he didn't really have a staff. Yeah. And this, this phrase, you know, that, that my men are the scum of the earth, that's not really what he thought, is it? He's, no, he's, it's, it's he's, terribly unfair. I mean, exactly. no one forgets there's a letter he wrote to Lord Bathurst yeah. in which he described his army as the finest, bravest troops in the world. Mm. Yeah. And, I mean, in some ways he's right. They are the scum of the earth. The but he made them into something important. he that, says in that yeah. same statement, it's yeah. amazing what fine fellows we've made of them. Yes. But I prefer the finest, bravest troops in the world. Yeah. Uh, because they did get him out of trouble. Yes. And they fought yeah. extraordinarily well. Yeah. And he knew that. Um, and he pays them that tribute, but he's always remembered for scum of the earth. But this is just after they just ransacked the French yes. baggage train at Vittoria. Yeah. And what do you expect? He was very, I mean, he, yeah, he, he could never stop that. It, it happened at Badajoz, and it, it happened two or three other times. And he couldn't Sebastian, stop it. He couldn't stop it. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
It's the thing the soldier dreams of, isn't it? Falling yes. into the yeah. enemy's baggage train, especially that yeah. one with the whole, all the loot of Absolutely. Spain in the baggage. Yeah. And Richard Sharp doesn't do badly at Vittoria, oh, does no, he? Sharp is going to join in with a will. Of course he is. He's, he's in there. there. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, what amazes me is there are all these wonderful paintings which yeah. are now hanging in galleries, or a lot of them in Apsley House still, of course, yeah. uh, which have been cut out of the frames and being used by muleteers as tarpaulins. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing. Yes. What, just thinking about his, his, you say he didn't really have a, st a general staff. I mean, his style was very autocratic. He wasn't very good at delegating, but that, that seemed to wear him out. That he took on so much, he just became careworn. And it wasn't until later in the campaign that he seemed really to trust his fellow officers. He had faith in himself, mm. and it seems to me if you want something done, you do it yourself. Mm. And lots of them were gossiping to their friends back home the crocus, in Parliament about yes. him. Yeah, the constant gossip about him. Yeah, and he sort of bore it all philosophically almost. But if something was going to be done, he planned it, yeah. and almost down to the, yeah. certainly to battalion level. Um, and he knew what he wanted. Yeah. And I mean, he continually complained about his own officers, certainly the junior officers, at not keeping discipline, mm. because he couldn't do that. Yeah. It's too far down the chain. Um, but certainly of his allies. I mean, he, in the end, he said, I've just given up complaining about the Spanish. Whatever you ask them to do doesn't it get done. Happen. Yes, yes. And if he didn't do it, it wouldn't be done. Yeah. So there he is, I mean, 30 odd battles and engagements in, in the peninsula, um, over the Pyrenees, finally into the siege of Toulouse, and this final moment where the abdication, uh, Napoleon abdicates and Louis XVIII becomes the restored king of France and it's over, it's over. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the banquet that they're at in Toulouse that evening suddenly erupts in 10 minutes of applause and cheering for him. And he sits there at the table, bowed and reflective and embarrassed, and then calls for the coffee after about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Doesn't quite know what to do with the adulation. Privately, I'm sure he did, but publicly. Publicly, no, well, it was like, I mean, when he, Hill is fighting in the Pyrenees and things are going a bit badly for the British and Wellington arrives and the Redcoats begin to cheer him mm. and he shuts them up, yep. stop it. And one, an officer asked him why. He said, if they'll cheer you one day, they'll jeer you the next. Yeah. Um, but the tra truth was they wanted to cheer him because they knew they were okay now. He those, was a winner. They, he yeah. arrived, yes. they may not have liked him as a person, but they wanted to be led by a winner. Who wouldn't? Yeah, well, the, you know, the famous one is Sergeant William Wheeler, isn't it? We know we'll always be looked after and we know we'll win. Yeah, yeah. And he took losses. But, I mean, he would, he, you know, he, he, he would take positions that he knew would cause losses. I mean, Badajosh is a great example. But he hated to waste men's lives. He was, he was, he was tormented sometimes by the losses, he even was, though he, he wouldn't show it. And, he was tormented, but his men knew that. His men knew that he yeah. really did care about them. Um, but I mean, I imagine that any general has to know he's going to lose lives. Mm. You don't go into this business yeah. without knowing that. Yeah. And it must be very tough, but he felt it very keenly. And of course, he also knew that there were no really reserves to come from Britain. I mean, the army he had was the army. and he's not going to get reinforced, or not substantially. So he doesn't want to lose too many because mm. this army is his instrument from going from Lisbon to Paris. Yeah. And he has, well, he starts with about 30,000, he ends up with about 60,000, Britain's only field army, mm -hmm. um, fighting against 350,000 French, in, uh, dispersed, they were never all together, thankfully, and he, he spends a lot of time, as you've written about, keeping them apart, stopping them, uniting, but he basically, does the job in the peninsula with an army of 60,000. I mean, he's in a rare, by the time he gets to Neve and the Nivelle, he's in a slightly odd position of outnumbering mm. his enemy, um, which is not a huge advantage because they're on the defensive. And, but that was unusual for him to actually feel he had a slight advantage in numbers. And then we come to Waterloo, um, the, the, the battle that defines him in the popular mind. And 
I mean, do, do you share my sense that the, you know, Waterloo was, I always say it was not strategically so important, but it had to be fought. Sooner or later, this, this nonsense of Napoleon's, this 100-day yes. nonsense, had to be brought to an end yeah. because you know, there were 700,000 troops closing in on France. And it so happened that you know, Wellington and Blücher were the first, they were sent out first and they met Napoleon first. So Waterloo, time and chance, dec decreed that the place would be Waterloo and it would be the Duke and Blücher. Yeah. But if it wasn't them, it would have been somebody else or somebody else. That it was, it, in a Wellington sense, it wasn't, strate you know, it wasn't a strategic hinge of European history, Waterloo, but somebody had to fight it. Yes, I mean, Wellington, I think, had studied Napoleon's campaign of 1814 yeah. and very much feared a repeat of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. What Waterloo does is basically make that impossible. Mm. Um, and you've written about Waterloo, I mean, not only through Sharp, and that Sharp's Waterloo, I'm guessing, is probably one of the most popular of the 23 Sharp books. I'm, I bet I don't it's the know, most read. I no idea. Well, I don't know, but I bet it is. But you've written separately about Waterloo, about you know three days and four battles and three armies and whatever, um, and that's I mean interesting stuff. And when the Duke said it was a close-run thing, he was absolutely right, wasn't he? Oh, he Lord, could have yeah. lost it. Three it's or the four most times. wonderful dramatic story. Yeah. I mean, that was the glory of writing the non-fiction book is I didn't have to make up a plot because it was already there. Mm. I mean, if you get to eight o'clock in the evening, you still don't know who's going to win. Mm. Um, and I'm told by reenactors or the people who play table warfare that it's almost impossible for Wellington to win. Yeah. That whatever you do, Napoleon always wins. Um, <laughs> which is ironic, I think. But yeah. I mean, it is an extraordinary story. And yet again, it's Wellington's common sense. I mean, he makes mistakes. I mean, the biggest one is La Haye Sainte, yeah. uh, as he later confessed. And he took, took responsibility for that failure. Yeah. Didn't send more ammunition? Didn't make sure they had enough ammunition? Not only that, but it wasn't, I mean, wasn't, wasn't properly defended. Yeah. Strengthened enough, I yeah. mean, the more yeah. loopholes and all the rest yeah. of it. And the King's German Legion, 400 of them went in and 42 made it back up to the ridge at yeah. the end of it. And the rest ran out of ammunition and were using their muskets as yes. clubs in the final yes. attack. They're coming in everywhere, as one of them said. Um, yeah. But then, of course, that leads to Napoleon's biggest mistake in the battle, because Ney immediately calls for reinforcements to attack straight up the road. And Napoleon yeah. says, does he think I can make men? Well, he had men, but he didn't send them. Yeah. And I think the battle would have turned very differently if he'd have attacked then and there. I mean, that's not to disparage Wellington. I mean, he found that position, he defended that position, he defended it damn well. He did. By the middle of the day, I mean, the battle starts at about 10 to 12, as far as anyone knows. I mean, nobody agrees what time the battle started. I know. Because nobody's watches agreed with each other in those days. And Wellington was about an hour out in his estimate. But the battle seems to start about 10 to 12. And by about four or five in the afternoon, I mean, he has no other choices. He's, no. he's on the ridge and he says, we. You know, I and every other Englishman, that's a mistake, because they weren't all Englishmen, of course. But he said, I and every other Englishman must stand and die on the ground we now, now occupy. And that's what, the, that's what the battle had become. There was no other choice by then. No, there isn't. And he's always looking over to his left to see if the Prussians are coming. Mm -hmm. Which in the film of Napoleon, they have him looking the wrong way. Yes. <laughs> I, I have a theory that, uh, you know, I think that, you know, I always say that, you know, Waterloo finished Napoleon, no question, but I think it finished Wellington in a psychological sense, that he said so many times after I fought my last battle, that the, the awfulness of that battle, the, the Mont yes. John Ridge, the fact that he had, a, he had an entourage, I mean, a little posse, a command posse, about 20 riders riding around the battlefield with him all day long, at the end of it, he was the only one who wasn't dead or wounded or, or wounded, missing. Yeah. Astonishing. Well, he certainly felt losses so badly, and to be left the master of that field was a horror story. And, I mean, we know he wept when mm. the doctor gave him the list, the butcher's bill, the next day. And I think it's heartfelt when he said, I pray to God I fought my last battle. Mm. He Which said it several times, mm -hmm. I fought my last battle. It was his phrase, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Bernard, you, you yourself have been c concerned with Hugemon, um, in terms of the restoration of Hugemon and the preservation of this moment, this, this, this right wing, the, the, the right flank that was held by the guards from almost, or guards and others, from almost the first shot to the very last. I mean, is that, is that important to you, Hugo Mon? Yes, it is. I mean, again, it's, 
a story of amazing heroism. And it's mainly the coal streamers, I think. But they did have help. I mean, there, were, there was a battalion from Nassau there. Yeah. Um, and it's an extraordinary story, though. Of, and I, I mean, I loved going to visit and visit Hougoumont. I really think it's so sad that the crucifix was stolen from the chapel. And I hope they retrieve that. Yeah. yeah. Which one day, no doubt, it will. Mm. Just before we move on from Waterloo, what do you make of Napoleon's handling of the Battle of Waterloo? Oh, it's chaotic. Mm. I mean, for a start, handing it all to Ney after he'd publicly said that he thought Ney was an idiot. Mm. Well, if you really think he's an idiot, why do you give him yeah. command of the troops? He was bravest of the brave, but he wasn't the best battlefield commander. No, it's clearly not. And he didn't deserve his fate. Mm. I mean, there's the myth that he actually escaped and went to South Carolina, which I'd love to believe, but it's just not true. <laughs> he was executed in December that yes, year, wasn't he? 1815, right. yeah. yeah. I mean, Napoleon makes so many mistakes. I mean, mm. the first is delaying the start of the battle. Yeah. I mean, two or three hours. I mean, wasn't it Napoleon who said, ask anything of me except time? Mm -hmm. And now he's giving time away to Wellington who needed it. Because he thought the ground was too wet, because it took yes, too long too to wet. drag the grand battery in, into place. I mean, no, I think he, I think his was gunners, just dilatory. His yeah. gunners told him that you know we yeah. we need firmer ground, um, and he just said fine. He yeah, said, yeah. Waited those hours. Mm. I mean, he knows the Prussians are coming by certainly by one o'clock, and still is letting a third of his army. Oh, sorry, we're talking, about, we're talking about Grouchy now, aren't Grouchy, we? Sorry, Grouchy, Grouchy following the, the Prussians. Yeah. And he's, not, he's sending him imprecise orders to come this way. Yes. And Grouchy carries on thinking he's, he's just going to fight the Prussians where he finds them, um, instead of coming back to the battle where Napoleon needed yeah, him. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's almost as astonishing as Derlon's corps at uh, yeah. Petra Bra. Yes, going backwards and forwards without mean, finding yeah. a shot between two battles. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. And Grouchy can hear the battle. Yeah. And I mean, he has many have said him march straight to the guns, and he doesn't. Yeah. That's not Napoleon to leave him wandering mm. about aimlessly. No. I want to move on to some of your characters and these, these people that you create. I mean, Sharp and Wellington, I, I, I sort of sense that they are, they're an important foil to each other. They, 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 they represent opposite ends of the social spectrum at the time when you imagine mm. them both, but they need each other. Well, they like each other and dislike each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I take the really overbold step of having Sharp save Wellington's life. At Assay. Yeah. At Assay, yeah. yes. Yeah. And he never would talk about what happened at Assay. Yeah. I mean, it's probably the closest he came to being killed. In reality, it was. In reality. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He was fighting Diamond with a sword in hand. Was, two, two horses come from under yeah. him. Yeah. Well, Diamond is piked and he's thrown off him. At, yeah. And he's among the enemy, and we know he did draw his sword to defend himself. Yeah. So that's where you play Sharp to yeah. save the Duke's life, yeah. and the Duke gives him a telescope, and that's the device to show the audience in subsequent novels that there's something special between Sharp and Wellington. Well, yes, I mean, I guess that you do feel a certain debt towards the man who saves your life. Yeah. And then Sharp is promoted from sergeant to ensign. Um, we know that Wellington disapproved of that. He said they always take to drink. Yes. Uh, well, Sharp doesn't take to drink. Um, but Sharp has an immense respect for Wellington. Mm. Um, I mean, I think he recognizes in Wellington, he's a man who's a natural soldier yeah. and who doesn't throw away your life carelessly. Um, Wellington, I think, is sure that Sharp is a rogue, but is his rogue. Um, and he calls on him for special jobs, that's yeah, the point. Yeah. He's, like, he's like the I mean, SAS remember, yes, for Wellington. He is. Yeah. I mean, this is fiction. You know, Sharp didn't exist. Of course. Although there were officers like John Ellie, who went from trooper to mm. lieutenant colonel over about 20 years. So mm. Sharp isn't unusual in that. And I can't mm. remember now the precise percentage of officers at Waterloo who were up from the mm. ranks. It's surprisingly high. Mm. Um, I mean, it was possible to get out to, to be promoted from the ranks. Although so rankers were, didn't usually, it was said, make particularly good officers. They found the transition too difficult or very difficult. I'm sure they did. Most I mean, of them. Sharp does much of the time, yeah. you know, because he yeah. ends up yeah. among Ruperts. Yeah. yeah. And he ain't a Rupert himself. No, um, not a Rupert. No. Um, I, w I want to ask about Sharp and you, Bernard, because, I mean, this, this man won't let you retire. All right? I mean, I mean what, what is, this dreadful man 
with his principled belligerence and his, his persistent bad language, he's got a hold over you, hasn't he? He yes, won't he let has. you stop. Well, he's been very good to me. I mean, my wife swims a mile a day in a pool we built, and she calls it Sharp's Pool. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm grateful to Sharp. And rather like Wellington, I don't think Sharp would like me very much, but I like him a lot. Yeah. Um, he's a grumpy old sod. Yeah. And he's a rogue, but he's our rogue. Yeah, and he's principled. That he has, the, he has, I mean, I suspect that this comes from deep inside you somewhere. He always seems to do the right thing, sometimes in the wrong way. Yes. But you rely on Sharp to do the right thing, don't you? Well, I think that's one reason why Wellington likes him. I mean, Wellington recognizes that Sharp is a very good soldier. Yeah. I mean, he can be a loose cannon at times, but he keeps a pretty tight rein on yeah. him until he needs him to be a loose cannon, then he lets him go. Let him go, yeah. And it's, I mean, just as Uhtred and King Alfred don't like each other, but need each other, I mean, Sharp certainly needs Wellington more than Wellington needs Sharp. Yeah. And in some ways, Wellington lets him down, but that's another story. Not yes. in the end. And doubtless you'll keep on writing about it. Let's move on to some of the other characters. You mentioned Uhtred and Alfred there. Again, you recreate both, and Alfred was a real person. Uhtred is your creation. And in the, the Last Kingdom series, we see quite a lot in the first books, the first few of Alfred, and this astonishing commander that he was. I mean, he, we know he fought about 20 odd battles. He lost more than he won oh, the yeah. battles. But he won the campaigns because he, he understood more fundamentally than Guthrum and Aston what was at stake. They thought if he won a battle, that settled it. But Alfred knew that that wasn't the end of it. Now, when he comes up with the, the fields, I mean, not the field, the, the boroughs. The yeah, birds, the boroughs, the birds, yeah. Which is a warfare by fortress. Mm. Um, and Defense in depth. Yes, and yeah. gradually the fortresses spread north. Yeah. And I mean, the trick to Alfred, I mean, you go and see that statue of him in Winchester, or the one in Wantage, and he looks mm. like a second row forward, yep. you know, loaded up with his chain mail. He was nothing like that. I mean, he was a, essentially a perennially sick man. Mm. Um, it may have been Crohn's disease, which is very debilitating. He's w physically mm. weak. I mean, his main interest in life, it seems to me, is theology. Mm. Um, he's an incredibly pious man uh, who's fascinated by academia, translates works into the English yeah. tongue, is passionate about education. None of this suggests a warrior. Mm. But what he is, is he's incredibly clever. And if we're going to be really honest, intelligence is quite rare among monarchs. Mm. Um, but here's this incredibly intelligent man who knows he has to fight. And he looks after his soldiers because he, they're necessary to him. Mm. And he devises a strategy that is going to work, which is the strategy of the boroughs. Yeah. Um, and in the end, it does work. In the, um, the TV series, The Last Kingdom, which I think has been a terrific hit, um, I mean, David Dawson plays Alfred. David plays, Dawson plays made beautifully. Beautifully, yes. It, it absolutely encapsulates my sense, and obviously the, the Alfred that you have written, he plays him beautifully. I mean, Alexander Draymond is very good as Uhtred, but there's David Dawson who gives real um, uh, meaning to a historical figure. That well, he's the moral right. centre of the series. Yeah. And I was rather worried when it got to the point of his death to see how it would survive without him, but it, it did. But yes, I mean, Uhtred and Alfred like each other about as much as Sharp and Wellington like yeah. each other, which is a yeah. grudging respect. <laughs> um, and again, Alfred knows, and he confessed as much, that he needed these men who could do what he couldn't do. He needed the second row forwards. Mm. I mean, think how terrifying it was. I mean, all through, right into the Middle Ages, you have these guys who strap on 70 pounds worth of armor, carry lead-weighted weapons, and reveled in it. And I remember meeting Martin Johnson, the wonderful English rugby captain who won the World Cup. And I thought, God, I can't even imagine facing someone like you in a battle like Agincourt. Yeah. Because you actually enjoy it. I mean, you've got to enjoy international rugby to play it. Because mm. you know you're going to be hurt. But these guys enjoyed it. Mm. And, you know, facing a line of men at arms coming at you with lead-weighted weapons knowing that they're actually thrilled to be there. Mm. 
I mean, they're animals. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, you know, we talk about Agincourt. I mean, you've written about Henry V. You've got a, a novel about Agincourt. Um, and again, I mean, Henry, most people think of Henry as a small person, but he wasn't. I mean, he was six foot two, six foot three. He was, uh, he was, he was exceptionally tall, as many of the Plantagenet kings were. And, and he, was a, he was a warrior. He was a fighter. Was Even a fighter if he wasn't too. a very clever one, he was a fighter, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yes, mm. he's a, I mean, there's a belligerence about him. Mm. Um, again, a not terribly pleasant man. Put him on a battlefield, and there's a determination there. Um, and I think he's clever enough at Agincourt, although I think the, probably the thing that really won the battle was the mud, which often didn't get talked about. It was all the archer, the archer, the archer, but I think the, the mud... The French it. knew they were facing arrow storms. They'd been facing arrow storms at Cressy and Poitiers. They got used to the idea, and then they, by Agincourt they're, they're wearing plate armour, which gives them a fair bit of protection to them, but not the horses. And so the arrow storm, which they fully expected, brings the horses down, and then the mud becomes the main factor. Yeah, wading through mud that is about knee deep in 70 pounds of armor. Yeah. And of course what the arrows do is it forces them to keep the visors shut. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't yeah. help you at all. Mm. And even to be struck by a blunt will throw you back a couple of paces. Yes, yeah. I mean, those arrows struck with immense force, they might mm. not pierce the armor, but they, yeah. but they will throw you back. Yeah. yeah. And you've got to feel sorry for the poor darling struggling through that field. Before we leave some of the other characters, I cannot resist asking you about Ethelflaed. Ethelflaed is, is um, I mean, you, you, you've written this character as part of the Last Kingdom series. I mean, she is the daughter of Alfred the Great. She is the, the wife of Ethelred of Mercia, who, who, I mean, you admit in the books, you traduced terribly for dramatic purposes. He was not at all a bad man. I mean, all the indicators are he's fine, but dramatically he has to be awful to give well, you Ethelflaed. I think Ethelflaed's. he was fairly awful, actually. Do you think? Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think she has all the virtues. Mm. And she has, she does have, I mean, she has a great bravery. Yeah. Um, and rallies men to fight against the Danes. Um, I'm not a great admirer of Ethelred. Quite okay. pleased to kill him off in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Bernard, we, we must come back to Wellington and the Napoleonic Wars and the legacy of, of Wellington as we're sitting here in Wellington's old office. Um, the, the 24th Sharp novel is due next year. This is Sharp Storm, mm -hmm. which is eagerly awaited, I know. It's a, it's a bit late off the, off the stocks or coming out of the, out of the shipyard, as it were. But what, what's the, the latest on the, the, the writing or the production of this novel? Well, it's two thirds finished. I just have that one third to go. Yes. Um, but life is militating against it rather at the moment. Mm. I mean, for instance, I'm here in England instead of sitting at home writing. Yeah. But it'll get done. Do you, do you isolate yourself do, when you write? Do you really go for it in long bursts of writing or do you... It's do a it? job like anything else. Yeah. I mean, I start at usually about 8 or 8.30 in the morning and mm. finish at 6 mm. with a break for lunch and walk the dog. Yeah. Um, and then get down to it again in the afternoon. Get down to it again in the afternoon, mm. yes. In terms of the, the way you write, I mean, it has been said, nobody writes better battle scenes than you. Um, and uh, some people say they're very gory. Others say, no, that, that's, that's pretty well what battle feels like. Yeah, and, I think uh, you, can't, you can't dismiss the gore from the battlefield. No, indeed. Um, but it's nice of them to say that. I mean, I have certain rules about it. I mean, if you read my non-fiction book, Waterloo, yeah. The very first chapter is a description of the field of Waterloo. Mm. Um, because until you've got the geography in your head, you can't understand what's going on. So I, whatever battle I'm writing about uh, begins with a passage to describe the battlefield, mm. so you know what's happening. And you always walk the ground, don't you? Oh, you've, always, you've visited yes. pretty well every battle site you've ever written about, I think. I think I have. I think I've visited every one of Wellington's battlefields except for Toulouse. Okay. Because that's so, so built over that I think it would probably be... Nothing to tell you, yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. sure the Calvin A. Hill, which is, you know, is now a suburb. Mm. Um, but yes, I always visit the battlefield, mm. which is always interesting. Um, the, the other thing is that, I mean, you write with, with great historical accuracy. I know you always say, and this, this, I know this question gets posed to you a lot, and you always say, I'm not a historian, I'm a storyteller. True. But there is always the sense of the zeitgeist in your novels. You always seem to get the feel of the period in ways that people follow and understand. Well, that's nice of you to say so. I mean, 
the history is not exact, it's not accurate, it, but it, it is, I hope, authentic. Mm. But it ha you have to do it that way. I mean, in, when I wrote Sharp's Company, which is the siege of, siege of Badajoz, I mean, the drama of that night was the breaches. Yeah. And truth to tell, we didn't get through the breaches. The French beat us at the breaches. It was the faint attack on the Tom castle. Picton and the castle that, that, the that other succeeded. End. Yeah. But if Sharp is going to be there, he's going to have to be at where the greatest drama is, which is the breaches. And if Sharp goes into a breach, he damn well gets through a breach. Yeah. And then you confess your fault in the historical notes, saying, sorry, folks, this is a, he didn't really do this. Yes. Nobody did. Yes, you're very honest in the historical notes, because you then lay out what's, what's been invented and what was true, and yeah. right down to quite interesting details about menus that, have, that occur in the book, or particular details that, of, of some social uh, convention. Well, you, you certainly, if you change history, you've got to confess your faults. Yeah. Um, and I do that willingly. Mm. I don't think anyone minds that Sharp gets through the breach, except for the French. <laughs> they did try publishing Sharp in France. Really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are easier ways to lose money. You can stand on the Pont Neuf and just throw your money into the Seine. Um, and I don't think they made Or you can publish money. Sharp novels. <laughs> yeah, the Sharp novels. And, he made a fan of a 14-year-old girl who lived in Paris, and she would write to me about Sharp, love letters. And I eventually wrote back to her and said, look, you're, you're in love with the wrong man. <laughs> Go and find a French hero. <laughs> yes. Well, you, know, you always say you're not a historian, you're a storyteller. But I know history teachers who tell their students to read your books as a way of understanding the zeitgeist, of having a rollicking good read and learning quite a lot about history. And, and I'm told there are good recruiting instruments. I mean, because what, if nothing else comes out, it, I share Wellington's admiration for the British soldier. Mm. And when he said, the brave is the finest, I believe him. And as he said, they get me out of trouble. They did at Waterloo. Yeah. It was the bravery of the average British redcoat that got him mm. through Waterloo. I mean, nothing he did strategically or tactically except to say to the lads, stay there. Do you think that's his great legacy? Is that, that the legacy of Wellington, ultimately? His interesting relationship with his troops, the, the army that he built? Yeah, and, but I still go back to the common sense. Yeah. That, um, I mean, we've all been in situations where we don't know what to do. And common sense will probably see you through. I mean, he had this incredibly pragmatic common sense. And... It solved problems for him. Yeah. And he trusted his soldiers, and we know they trusted him. Yeah. And I imagine that's still vitally important. If you go into battle today, and sadly we do and probably will, you've got to have faith in the people who are directing you, that they're going to make the right choices. Yeah. The storyteller, who is not a historian, whom historians take very seriously, Bernard Cornwell, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure.